Well, friends, today we are continuing in our Lord's Holy Week. Uh, because of the snow from a couple of weeks ago, our schedule has gotten a little shuffled in the order of readings. And so the passage that happened before our passage for today, that was the subject of Pastor uh, Tom Friedrich's message, uh, which he titled In and Out of Season. Of course, there he reminded us that God expects and encourages faithfulness from his people, both in and out of season. And so that was the end of the day on Monday, the Monday of Holy Week. And so today we're picking up with the Tuesday of Holy Week. And so I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 27 through 33. They came to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. And so they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why did you not believe him? But if, if we shall say from men, Well, they were afraid of the people, for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grant, almighty God, that as you not only adopted us as your children, from before we were born, and as soon as we came forth from our mother's womb, you signed us with the symbol of your holy redemption, which has been obtained for us by the blood of your only begotten Son. Though we have, by our ingratitude, renounced so great a benefit, may we return to you and to your most gracious providence. Well, I have three headings for today's message, a good old-fashioned three-point Baptist sermon. First is the question that leads up to Jesus' teaching. Next, we'll look at the implication of Jesus' teaching, and then we'll close with the application of Jesus' teaching. And so first, let me give a little bit of background to the question at hand. If you remember the past two days of Jesus' ministry, recall what has happened. Remember, this is Tuesday of Holy Week. He's entered Jerusalem triumphantly. He left. He came back into the temple. He headed straight there, and he cleansed it. On Sunday, he surveyed. On Monday, he cleansed. And today, he teaches. And on Sunday, if you remember, the leaders of the temple were conspicuously absent. They were not present at his entry. On Monday, they were visibly upset. Very clearly, Mark tells us. And so today, they want to set a trap. And so Mark introduces these leaders who came to Jesus as he was walking in the temple. They are, he says, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And it's useful for, to, for us to know who or, or what these offices represent. The chief priests are the official ministers of the people. They represent the people before God when they go in their temple. For all intents and purposes, these are the pastors of the churches. The scribes are the professional interpreters of the Mosaic Law. They're, they're essentially religious lawyers. 
We don't like lawyers, do we? We love lawyers. Got you back there, Harrison. The, these are like the, the seminary professors, if you will. These are, these are the, the smart guys. And then we have the elders. These are the religio-political aristocrats, if you will, of the Sanhedrin. They, they're the elites of society. Uh, they're the ones who, who range from landowners to, to wealthy merchants to noblemen. That's who these folks are. These are the movers and the shakers who, who exist in between the pastors and the seminaries. And so what, what we see here within this picture, within this group, we have the whole gamut of religious life represented in these three offices. In fact, these three groups make up the two ruling parties in Jerusalem, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We know all about political parties, don't we? The scribes and the elders, they were mostly the Pharisees. And the chief priests were mostly the Sadducees. And the Pharisees were theological conservatives. And the Sadducees were theological liberals. And like today, you would never find bipartisan support unless they had a common enemy. So that these two groups, the left and the right, have come together to narrow in on Christ, that tells us something. That tells us that they are shaken to the core at who Jesus is. I wonder what would happen if our Republicans and Democrats were equally shaken to the core at Jesus Christ. These three groups and two parties represented the Sanhedrin. This was a 71-member body, and they oversaw the religious and legal aspects of Jerusalem. These were the guys who were in charge. And for all intents and purposes, they were the quote-unquote leaders of the church. And I put that in quotes. Because it is these so-called leaders who challenge Jesus' cleansing of the temple. That was their concern. They're a day late because they needed to go and dwell on it. But that's their concern. Their corruption ran so deep that they refused to see the unholiness that had creeped into the temple. That there was unrighteousness even within their own house. Perhaps indeed their own pockets were being lined by the extortion in the market stalls. Undoubtedly, they felt challenged by Jesus' entire ministry as he calls them forth for repentance and for change. Now, it's not impossible for the visible church to become polluted. In fact, that was Paul's concern in many of his letters. In fact, that was Jesus' concern with the church's the seven churches in Asia Minor. If the church is not on its guard, false teachers and false doctrines will creep in. Today, the visible church is beset on all sides. From martial nationalism to militant Marxism. From impractical legalism to immoral license. From principled know-it-alls to pragmatic ne'er-do-wells, the church is beset on all sides. And so the call from the apostles is for the church to seek unity and purity. Now, often enough, we hear about unity. We hear that a lot. That's one of our favorite aspects in our denomination. Yet true, biblical, Christ-centered unity cannot happen without purity. Now, by purity, I don't mean perfection, because no one is perfect in this life. 
By purity, Scripture means we are to seek after Christ uniquely. We are to prioritize God chiefly. And we are to obey the Spirit humbly. That is what it means to have purity and unity in the church. Otherwise, if we lack these things, if we are not focused, then we're no better off than the Sanhedrin who crucified Christ. And so Jesus responds to their question by once again employing the Socratic method. We talked about that before, how Jesus will answer a question by by asking another question to draw out the presuppositions of the people. He says, answer me this, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Jesus' question is a question of authority. From whence does this prophetic authority come? By whose authority did John baptize? That's what Jesus is asking. And so they immediately recognize the implication. And here's our second point. If John's ministry was self-authorized, meaning that he initiated it of his own accord, that without regard to the scripture, he, he carried out these things. If it was by men, then he carried it with no true authority. That's the first implication. Now, the second implication, if John's ministry was true and that of a true prophet and truly Uh, called by God, then his authority comes directly and only from God, whom these leaders are to represent. And so they rightly deduce. If they answer from heaven, then Jesus has the grounds to rebuke them for not listening to John. And if they say from men, They not only have Jesus to answer to, but now they have the throngs who followed John, who believed he is a prophet. And here's what they also realize, the deeper implication, because it doesn't end at John's authority. Jesus' question threatens their own authority. By whose authority did the chief priests hand over their duties to the Pharisees. Because that's what they did. The chief priests stopped doing what the Bible told them to do. By whose authority did the high priest hand over his office to the Romans? That's what he was. He was bought and paid for by the Gentile empire. By whose authority did the scribes take over scriptural interpretation? By whose authority did they bind the consciences of the people with their traditions? By whose authority did the elders take on the politics of Rome? By whose authority did they usurp scripture from tradition? These things are running through their heads more than likely. Jesus cast a shadow on their own positions within God's economy. Now think about that in your own life. When your authority is challenged, doesn't that bother you? If an underling or an employee or a student or someone challenges your authority, you generally don't like that, right? Raise your hand if you like being challenged in your authority. Managers, bosses, whatever, they are offended by insubordination. And so here we see in their minds this peasant teacher from out in the middle of Gretna, I mean Nazareth, has come up. They're they're threatening his power, their power, and he's, uh, the people admire him. Why are they following him? They need to be listening to us. They're nervous. They're scared. And they're offended. But Jesus was more than that. He was more than just a wise peasant or a brilliant rabbi. He is the son of God. 
and he has come to make straight the crooked paths of false teachers. And that is what they did not want. They did not want to give up their earthly power and authority over to the true Son of God. And so out of their own self-preservation, they decide to answer to Jesus, we don't know. Meh. Jesus' credentials are not up for debate. You either accept him or you reject him. Jesus' credentials are not up for debate. Now Jesus does go on to list his credentials in the next passage, but he does so in the form of a parable. And we'll talk about that when we get there next week. But do you remember why Jesus teaches in parables? He said in chapter 4, verse 11, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom, but those who are outside get everything in parable, parables. To his unrighteous interlocutors, he says to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus says, refuses to affirm his authority before those who are unwilling to even recognize it. And so he will use this as a teaching moment to turn the tables on their own heads. But again, we'll talk about that next week. For now, I want to get to the third point, the application. So what? So what? what? What does this passage mean for us? What is it? How does it impact us today? Well, the doctrine of authority has application today within the church and within our lives. The leaders of Christ's church must lead through divine authority. Now, this does not mean that the elders and pastors of the church are given godlike powers. That's not what I'm saying. There are some Christians who believe that, but that's not what I'm saying, and that's not what the Bible says. Rather, the authority of preachers and elders today must come from God, and not from their own self-ambition, and not from the earthly desire. St. James warns us, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Why is that, James? What is it about preaching and teaching that would cause a teaching elder to incur a stricter judgment? Well, it's because their role, it's authoritative in nature. It is an authority that is given by God. And so to lead God's people into false teaching betrays not only an unregenerated heart, but also a wicked desire to lead people astray. And so those who are called to this office don't just have a feeling of a calling. I hear that a lot. I'm on the examinations committee of the presbytery. I hear a lot of people who say, oh, I felt this call. Now, that is important. Having a feeling is important, but it's not enough. Those who are called to this office are not just recognized by a church. Just because a congregation out there has laid hands on someone does not mean that that person has been authorized by God. Though that is a necessary component, congregational recognition is not enough. Those who are called to this office must have divine authority. And once again, I don't mean church leaders are to play God. What I mean is that true godly leaders have as their foundation, as their worldview, and as the center of their lives intertwined with the Bible. That's what I'm talking about here. The Bible 
as God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word is the sole authority by which we preach and teach and rule. So pay attention, elders. Those of you who are on the nominating committee, those of you who the nominating committee has approached, listen up. This is for you. Church leaders have, as the, have the Bible as their foundation. They are grounded in the scriptures. What does that mean? That means you are in it, you are studying it, you are, are, are trying to take in the teaching. If there is something about the Bible that confuses you, you research it. You ask me or you ask a resource. You uh, consult a commentary or a study Bible. Your, the Bible is your foundation. Foundation of your faith. The foundation of your life. Church leaders have the Bible as their worldview. That they see the world through the lens of Scripture. That they take in from, from the world things through the filter of Scripture. Things from social media, things from mass media, things from uh, what we read in novels and everything. Everything needs to be filtered through the Bible. Now, did you hear what I said? I didn't say don't read those things. I forget who it was. I'm sure it's a famous pastor who had in one hand the newspaper and the other the Bible. It's important. But you must be filtering what you are taking in through the Bible. That's what it means to have a biblical worldview. And church leaders have the Bible as the center of their lives. Not only are they in it and reading it and studying it and using it as a worldview, they are applying and interacting with the world according to the scriptures. When God says to do something, we do it. When God says not to do something, we don't do it. Now, where does God tell us these things in the Bible? And so church leaders, elders, myself included, I want you all to hold me accountable to this as well. But it's also my role to hold you all, elders especially, accountable as well. If preaching or teaching or ruling is counter to the scripture, is done not according to the scriptures, then it is false and it is unauthorized. And so the only way to discern if teaching is false is to have the Bible as the hub of your life. You know what the hub of a wheel does? Think about it when you look at a bicycle or, or a motorcycle especially. That hub does two things. It keeps the wheel aligned and true. Otherwise, you're going to be feeling it. And it connects the wheel to the rest of the chassis, to the rest of the body. And so the Bible is what rightly aligns us with God's desire. We know what pleases God because he tells us in his word. And the Bible is what connects us to one another and to God. He speaks through it, and we listen to it as a community of faith. And so my goal as your pastor is to live into this biblical authority. And your responsibility as Christians is to do likewise. You may not have the calling to, to preach or to teach, but each and every one of us is called to live under the authority of Scripture. I must strive to make the Bible my foundation, my worldview, indeed the hub of my life. I must, and I struggle, but I must. I don't have it all figured out. But I'm in the process, and I'm willing to undertake that process. And so my question to you, church, is are you willing to undertake the process of making Scripture the sole authority in your life? Are you ready to let the Bible be your authority 
and to authorize your gifts, your ministry? If so, I especially want you to join me in prayer. And I want to pray as well for our elders and potential elders. So let's pray. Holy God, I, I pray that each and every one of us and the leaders that you have called for this church, that we have a biblical foundation, that we have a firm footing in, in God's inerrant word, that we have a, a biblical worldview, a, a strong grasp of God's infallible word, and that we have a biblical life, a central focus on God's inspired word. Lord, this is your desire for each and every one of us, but Lord, it is especially true for your teaching and ruling elders. God, I pray that there is a desire in every heart to submit to the authority of Christ as our king and as our head. Lord, I pray that there is wisdom within our hearts and within our leadership to discern true teaching from false teaching and that there is a willingness in each and every one of us to defend the faith. Lord, I pray that there is an encouragement in every leader's heart, that every believer is encouraged to stand with authority for and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we are strengthened and we are renewed and we grow in our faith through the authority that you have given to Christ. And that authority is revealed to us in your word. And so God, I again pray that the word be so ingrained in us and around us that it is our foundation that it is our worldview, and indeed it is our very life. I pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.